Okay, so welcome. Um, we're going to talk about the bond market today, and there's several things that we're going to be interested in. This is Chapter 5 of, of Michigan's Money and Banking Tax. So the main questions of interest are really, again, looking at the basics of the bond market, both the supply side and the demand side. So it's natural to want to understand uh, the shape of the bond, bond supply and bond demand functions, um, why they slope the way they do, look at the equilibrium effects, and then, of course, look at how changes in those equilibrium occur. So... First of all, we're, we're going to take a closer look at uh, supply and demand in the bond market. So before I do that, though, it's important to note that there's a lot of different types of bond markets out there, um, and a lot of, it's based a lot on uh, the risk of these particular securities, the maturity of those, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to talk about a generic bond market, and later on in the textbook, we'll talk more specifically about different types of bond markets and how um, interest rates can vary um, in those markets. So... Like every market, you have a supply side and a demand side, and so that composes the entirety of the market. So in terms of uh, the demand side, uh, again, the idea of demand is that you have people who uh, wish to hold bonds for various reasons. So presumably, the demanders are investors who want to hold those bonds to earn a return or a premium. Um, and so for a one-year discount bond, for, for instance, the expected return to bondholders is essentially equivalent to the interest rate as it's related to the yield to maturity. Um, and so as, as it turns out, for all different types of bond structures that you can have, you can have a discount bond, a console or a perpetuity as it's called, or also what's referred to as a coupon bond. The fundamental uh, part of this story is that the price of a bond and the yield on that bond or the interest rate are gonna be inversely related. So that's sort of a fundamental and important aspect of this whole story here. OK, um, and so to give you an idea, and I'm going to fumble through this a little bit, um, it turns out that the interest rate is going to be equal to, for a bond, the face value of the security minus the current price that you pay, and then divided by the price that you pay for that security. OK, and so I have um, a list of sort of hypothetical prices here. Um, and so from that, you can pretty easily calculate what the interest rate you would expect to be on those particular um, uh, on those particular bonds, given that particular price. Um, and it's, again, this is for um, this formula here is for a simple one year, what's referred to as a discount bond. OK. And so, again, the idea is you pay uh, a particular price and then that bond matures uh, in a one-year time frame, and you, are, you earn this, uh, the face value of that bond. And so I won't go through the, the details of, of this. As I said, it's pretty straightforward to plug the prices into here um, and determine what the interest rate should be given a particular current price of that bond. Okay. And so the important thing is that um, thinking about this market structure, well, what does demand look like and what does supply look like? Okay. For right now, we're going to focus on demand. And so in this example here, we have some hypothetical um, quantity of bonds demanded um, by investors. And so you can see that for each price that we have, there's some uh, amount of quantity demanded of those bonds. Okay. Now, here's the key aspect to thinking about the demand side of the bond market. So as I said before, you have investors who would like to hold bonds because they earn a return, okay? And so the idea here is that as the price that they pay of those bonds goes up, the interest rate or the yield that they get, the return on those bonds, actually gets smaller. So the incentive for bondholders to hold bonds goes down as the price goes up. That is the gap in terms of the profit they're going to earn from holding that bond gets smaller and smaller as the price they pay gets bigger and bigger, okay? So at the end of the day, what that means is that as the price goes up, you can see the interest rate or the return on holding that bond goes down, and therefore the incentive for people to hold those bonds decreases, and therefore the quantity demanded at that price declines, okay? Oops. And so what we have here then is, um, let's see, how do I get to, oops, how do I get to the, the blank board here? 
Oh, there we go. Okay. So using that table, again, we can draw a demand here, hypothetical demand, where we have the price of bonds on this axis, the quantity demanded of bonds on this axis, and it's pretty easy to see, given the previous table of data, that we have this downward sloping relationship, as I mentioned before. So, for instance, at a price of 95, given those hypothetical numbers, if you want to hold 1150 at 94, people are going to hold 1200, and at a price of, say, 92, people are going to choose to hold 1300. Uh, and this can be measured in, say, billions of dollars of bonds or something like that. Okay. Now, again, the, the important thing to note is that the interest rate, as we saw, is inversely related to the price here. And so as the price goes up, the implied interest rate on that bond is going to go down. Okay, so that's important to, to keep in mind. So the punchline here is, again, that we have our demand schedule for bonds is going to be downward sloping, okay, for the reasons that I mentioned before. Now, what about supply? Well, supply, just like we'd expect, is going to be upward sloping, right? And so the intuition behind supply is you have institutions like corporations, that's businesses, and you have governmental entities. Those are the ones that are supplying bonds to the public. What are they doing? They're borrowing money. That's why you issue bonds. Okay. So for corporations, they issue bonds because they want to raise capital, and so that's a form of borrowing by, by companies. For the government, they may run deficits and require borrowing from the public, and therefore they're going to also um, supply bonds and issue uh, new bonds. And so in this case, as you would expect, Our bond supply is going to be upward sloping. And again, if you go back to that table um, that we looked at before, that's this one right here. I'm just pulling these hypothetical numbers from here. Okay. And so if we look at this, um, again, pulling from those numbers, oops, at a price of 92. We have bond supply of 1,000 at a price of 94. Again, these are the same interest rates that we had before. That's a price, uh, uh, sorry, quantity supply to 1,200. And at a price of 95, there's going to be 1,300 um, in bond supply. Okay. Now, what's the intuition behind this? Well, again, it comes back to thinking about the interest rate. The idea here is that as the price of bonds rises, okay, keep in mind that the interest rate is going to go down. And so the interest rate represents the cost of borrowing by firms and government. And so if it becomes cheaper for firms and government to borrow as the price goes up, there's going to be more willing and able to want to uh, access credit markets to create more debt through bond issuance, and therefore the supply of bonds is going to rise. Okay, so as the price of bonds goes up, the quantity of supply, the quantity supplied of bonds rises, and vice versa. Now, I should pause here. Um, it's important again to think about the construct of these supply and demand curves. The numbers that I gave you. Those are hypothetical. And when we think about all supply and demand curves, they are literally hypothetical. In the event that, say, price is X, then you would expect this amount of uh, bonds supplied to the market. And as you vary that hypothetical, then there's going to be this hypothetical amount of um, supply as well as demand side. So the punchline here is that the bond supply curve is upward sloping as we saw the bond demand curve um, is downward sloping as well. 
So if we put these two things together, an equilibrium in the bond market is going to occur naturally where bond supply is equal to bond demand. Okay, um, and so if we put these things together, we have our bond supply function, our bond demand function, and as it turns out, if you go back to the previous slides, that occurs at a price of, I'll have to dig my drawing out here again, at a price of 94 and a quantity of 1200. That's where those two intersect and that's our equilibrium, of course. Um, so the more interesting case here, of course, is what happens if we're out of equilibrium, right? So if we're at a price, say, at P1, then that's going to be a situation oops, where we have an excess supply in the bond market, okay? What that means is that there's more bonds floating out around there than what people would like to hold at that price. And so natural market mechanisms are just going to push the price back to equilibrium. In this case, because people hold more bonds than they want, they're going to try to get rid of those bonds. That's going to naturally push down the price in the bond market. And as the price in bond market goes down, that gap closes and we end up back at equilibrium. Okay. And the same holds for a below equilibrium price. Right. So in this case here, we have an excess demand in the bond market. Again, people want to hold more bonds than what's currently in the marketplace. So that's going to create a shortage and bid up the price of bonds. As the price goes up, that shortage disappears. And again, keep in mind, as the price goes up, the interest rate goes down because of that inverse relationship. Okay. So with that, um, we're going to look a little bit closer at the bond market. And if I was more organized, I would have put this on a slide. But there's some general things when we think about assets. Again, this doesn't necessarily apply to bonds. It applies to a lot of different types of assets. Um, there's going to be four major factors that determine the demand for assets. Okay. So ultimately, what we're doing is we're thinking about things that are going to shift the demand for assets, and in particular, shift the demand for bonds. And so these are going to be things such as wealth. We can also put income in here, although th those are two separate um, concepts, they're uh, very closely related. The second is the expected return. Relative to alternative assets. So here, the idea is simply that we don't have to hold bonds, we can hold other things that earn a return. Okay, and we'll, we'll see how that's going to affect uh, the demand um, shortly. Also, the risk of alternative assets. And here, again, we're thinking about this in a relative term. If I can hold bonds or I can hold other assets, then if there's a change in the riskiness of one relative to the other, that's going to change the calculus for uh, how much bonds I want to hold relative to these other assets. And then lastly, liquidity. And I'll talk about what that means here in, a, here in just a minute. Okay. And so all of these factors here are going to lead to shifts in the demand for bonds. Okay. And we'll see some examples about why that is. Now, again, it's important to understand the distinction between changes in demand and changes in the quantity of demand here. These things are going to be changes in the demand curve. So at any given price, at any given interest rate, this is going to affect the quantity demanded, and therefore that's going to shift that demand schedule. If the price changes or the interest rate changes through exogenous pro uh, processes, 
then that's just going to move us up and down these hypothetical demand or supply schedules. So they don't shift it, that's a moving along. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of how this might work. So the first example, suppose that we expect the stock market returns to increase, okay? So again, in a relative sense, set as paribus, assuming the bond market stays the same, then the returns in the stock market are gonna be more attractive. So people are naturally gonna to wanna to hold more stocks and therefore less bonds because uh, the relative return on bonds is gonna be lower. So what that's gonna do in this simple bond demand schedule is it's gonna to shift to the left. So in other words, at any given price, at any given interest rate, the demand for bonds is going to decrease. So that demand curve is going to shift to the left. Okay. Um, here's a different example. Suppose we have a decline in expected inflation. Okay. This plays into the idea of the uh, expected return on bonds relative to other assets here. So in this case here, with a decline in, in expected inflation, what that's going to translate to is an expectation for a decline in the real value of the bond, the real return on that bond. So in that case, again, if we have a decrease in the expected real return, on our bond, well, that's gonna give less incentive for investors to wanna to hold that relative to other assets. And therefore, you would expect the demand for bonds to fall, just like what we saw here in this example. Okay, so the demand curve in this example here, and I'm gonna be sloppy with this, you can't do this on the exam. Again, you're gonna see that bond demand curve shift to the left, okay? Here's a different example. Suppose we have a stock market bubble. Everybody knows it's a stock market bubble. Eventually it's gonna burst. That means our stocks are more risky. So the safe play of course is to put your money in bonds. So again, it's not too hard to see that this, this is gonna result in an increase and the demand for bonds. So as we saw before, what's gonna happen is our bond demand curve then is gonna to shift to the right. Again, why does it shift to the right? At any given price and at any given interest rate, people would rather hold more bonds and less stocks because the stocks are more risky. And so the quantity demanded increases for bonds at any given price and interest rate, and that translates to a shift to the right of our bond demand curve. Here's another example. Suppose there's a decrease in the liquidity of bond markets, okay? Now, first of all, let's back up and talk about liquidity for a second. The idea of liquidity here is simply the ability to transform one asset into another asset. Or you can think of this more generally as how easily can I buy or, or sell this asset? So it turns out in markets that are really thin, that is they don't have much liquidity, then it's going to be harder to be able to sell uh, certain assets. And so um, they're going to command a higher price in order to be able to sell those things. Okay. So more generally, if you have a decrease in bond liquidity, say for various reasons, if people just decide bonds aren't the thing to do, um, or uh, if there's problems in the functioning of bond markets, for instance, that can impact liquidity. For whatever reason, if liquidity in the bond market goes down, again, 
you would expect the demand for bonds to decline. And of course, the relative demand for other assets is going to go up as a result. So I went very quickly through some of these examples. Um, this is a, a summary of the things that I talked about before, and I went through uh, all of these. Again, there's um, uh, the, the inflation, the expected inflation really ties into this expected return on uh, other assets in terms of um, the, de the demand side effects. Okay. Now let's look at the supply side for a minute. So in terms of supply, there's three basic factors that are going to affect the supply of bonds. The first is the expected profitability of capital investments. And so again, when we think about supply, who, who is supplying bonds? Well, it's more like firms who are issuing bonds. That creates the supply, right? And so it's firms that are issuing bonds, and it's also governments. But on the firm side, if we think about firms and the profitability of capital, if, for instance, capital is going to become more productive and more profitable to hold, then firms are going to want to invest more in capital and infrastructure investments. And therefore, if they borrow to do that, use credit markets, then they're going to want to issue more bonds in order to do so. Okay. The second thing... is expected inflation. Now, this is going to affect the supply side in similar but different ways than the demand side, like what we talked about before. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then the third piece are government budget deficits. So again, the simple intuition here is that if the government is running deficits, if their debts are rising, and somehow they have to cover those deficits, then the natural way is to borrow. And so the government does this through the bond markets. And of course, um, in the recent past, um, deficits have been increasing very rapidly in the United States. And so there's been a big influx in uh, treasury bonds in, in, in these markets. So let's look at a few examples of how this plays out. Suppose we have a recession and that reduces profitability of capital. Okay. So again, the idea here is that during recessions, naturally, firm profits go down, and therefore the uh, return on investments of capital is going to decrease as well. And so because of that, there's less, uh, it's less likely that firms are going to want to sink a bunch of money into new capital and equipment um, because of the fact that there's going to be less of a payoff, uh, at least in the near term for that. And so because of that, you would expect Again, at any given price for the bonds and at any given interest rate, there's going to be a decline in firms' willingness to issue new, new bonds. And so that's going to result in a decline in the supply of bonds. Okay. And so, again, if we look at this market, if you recall, our bond supply curve is upward sloping. Our price is here. And the quantity is there. Okay. So what that's going to do that's going to result in a decline in our supply of bonds. So here's, a, again, a different example. Let's suppose that an expected inflation is going to increase. So people think inflation is going to go up uh, in the future. Okay. Now, what this is going to do is, on the firm side, this is going to reduce the real cost of borrowing. Now, keep in mind, when we talked about it on the demand side, that meant that a reduction in the real interest rate means that people aren't going to want to hold those bonds, so that ended up reducing demand for bonds. Here, the story is different. Here, we're looking at it from the supply side. If expected inflation goes up, then that means the, the real uh, payout that the firms are going to have to issue is going to be lower because the real interest rate that they're paying is going to be lower on that. And so because of that, 
because of the decline in the debt burden in real terms, that means it's going to be cheaper to issue new credit. And so that's going to be an inducement for firms to want to increase their bond issuance, and therefore you would expect an increase in the, sorry, the supply. That should be the supply of bonds. Okay. And so in this case, what we would see, again, supply is upward sloping. And I'm being a little bit sloppy here, which you can't do on the exam, as I said before. Okay. So that's what we would expect to happen in this example. One last example. Um, government deficits increase. Okay. Again, I sort of talked through that example just a few minutes ago. Um, what we've seen in the last several years since 2008, there's been a big increase in deficits and the need for government finance and borrowing. And so, as you see deficits rise, there's going to be an increase in the issuance of Treasury bonds. And so, that's naturally going to lead to, again, an increase in the supply of bonds, just like what we saw in this last example here, in terms of qualitative effects. So, we can summarize all of these things. Um, here, in terms of these various factors, um, again, if we flip the, 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 the uh, direction around here, that's going to result in the opposite um, shift, as I talked about before. Um, but again, this is a good opportunity to really um, take the time to understand the distinction between changes in the supply versus changes in the quantity supplied, changes in demand versus changes in quantity demanded. A movement along the supply curve is a change in quantity supplied. Okay. And then we can have shifts of that supply curve, which are a result of not changes in price or interest rates, but changes in other factors that we just talked about, which are going to shift the supply curves and also the respective demand curves. Okay, so now we can put all of this stuff together, and this is the, the best part about it, is this is going to allow us to really understand basic movements in interest rates, right? The equilibrium effects, and then once we put these pieces together, how that translates into movements in um, bond rates. So if we consider some changes in equilibrium, um, again, we can go through a bunch of examples here. Um, I'm only going to go through a few, um, but suppose we have a decrease in wealth. So, for instance, through, um, you know, recessionary effects or there's some sort of external shock or something like that. Um, well, in this case, let's just focus on the wealth part, right? As I said before, a decline in wealth, that's going to lead to a decline in the demand for bonds and also a decline in the demand for other assets, too. Okay, but in this case, we're focused on just the bond market. And so if we look at our equilibrium effects, again, as we talked about before, a decline in wealth is going to shift the demand for bonds to the left. And so you can see the quantity of bonds is going to go down. And the price of bonds is also going to decline, okay? Again, keeping in the back of our heads that we have this inverse relationship between price and the interest rate. So the equilibrium effect on interest rates is that you would expect interest rates to rise because of this. Okay. Here's the example that I talked about before with the rise in government deficits, 
So again, as we talked about, that's going to result in the need for greater financing by the government. And so you would expect that the supply of bonds is going to go up, right? And so this is an important result here. So naturally you can see that the total volume of bonds in the market is going to rise, but also the price of bonds is going to go down, right? What does it mean when the price of bonds goes down? Interest rates go up, okay? And so interest rates are going to go up as a result of these higher deficits. Now, this can be important because, as we'll see later on, this can lead to uh, crowding out of private investment as a side effect of higher government deficits. And that can be pro problematic for a variety of reasons. And I should add to this, too, not only does it increase the cost of borrowing to the private sector, okay, but it can also increase the, the future cost of issuing debt by the government, which sort of adds a double whammy in terms of raising the deficit. Now recall, we talked about expected inflation in a couple of different scenarios. We talked about it in terms of impacting the demand side and also impacting the supply side for similar but different reasons, okay? So let's look at those two things together. Let's suppose that expected inflation goes up, okay? For whatever reason, um, we can talk about those uh, later on in, in um, the chapters on uh, money growth and inflation. But let's just suppose that expected inflation rises, okay? And so on the demand side, again, what we talked about is that with higher expected inflation, that's going to reduce the return for bondholders, right? And so there's going to be a de decrease in the incentive for people to hold those bonds because there's going to be a lower real return or uh, inflation-adjusted return on those bonds. So here, you would expect on the demand side, the demand for bonds to go down. As we just talked about, on the supply side, again, if expected inflation goes up, it's going to be cheaper in real terms for firms to issue credit. It's also going to be cheaper for government in real terms to issue credit. Now, that's not going to affect the government's decision to issue debt or not, um, but it primarily affects the firm's decisions, right? And so the punchline here, then, is that you would expect on the firm side, because there's um, it's cheaper to access credit markets in real terms, the supply of bonds, the issuance of bonds to um, increase capital expenditures is going to go up, okay? So if we put those two things together, We have two of these factors sort of moving simultaneously. So as I said, cheaper credit means bond supply is going to rise. Lower real return means that bond demand is going to go down and shift to the left. So if we put these two factors together, Here's where we started out, the price of bonds up here, okay? With both of these things shifting simultaneously, we're going to end up somewhere down here. And what that means, the price of bonds is going to fall in equilibrium, which means, of course, the interest rate is going to go up, okay? Now, there's a couple things to really keep in mind here. There's two things going on at the same time. You have supply changing and demand changing. Now we can say something in particular about what's gonna to happen to the price of bonds here and hence the interest rate. We know that the interest rate is gonna unambiguously increase in here. Why is that? Well, because both of these, the supply shift and the demand shift move in reinforcing ways to lower the price and hence increase the interest rate, okay? What we can't say is what happens to the quantity, the equilibrium quantity here. It could go up, it could go down, and it could stay the same. 
and you can play around with the, the relative shifts of supply and demand and see how you could actually get an increase in quantity, an e decrease in quantity, or keeping the same, okay? But the punchline here is the effects here in terms of the higher expected inflation leading to higher nominal interest rates in the bond market, okay? This is what's referred to as the Fisher effect. And so the Fisher effect says there, sh there should be a strong, a pretty strong correlation, not perfect, but there should be a correlation between expected inflation and the nominal interest rate. As nominal interest rates rise, uh, sorry, as expected inflation rise, as we talked about, that's gonna reduce the real cost of credit. And so uh, financial markets are gonna wanna adjust for that fact. And therefore you would expect interest rates, nominal interest rates to rise to overcome um, that compensating effect. And so that's what this Fisher effect here um, tells us. Now, if you wanna see this in action, let's see. Uh, there it is, sorry. If you wanna see this in action, um, you can actually look at the data. Uh, here we have, I think this is a three month interest rate here, the blue line. The red line represents a measure of expected inflation. And sure enough, you can see that for the most part, those two things move more or less in tandem with one another. Again, they're not perfect, but um, they all they do move um, pretty closely together, uh, at times uh, more so than less, okay? Let's look at one more example. Suppose that the economy starts to expand, okay? Um, it turns out, uh, again, we're gonna have um, a couple of different things going on here. And so, in, in particular, what we see is with economic expansions, you have an increase in income and wealth. And what we talked about before, that's gonna increase uh, the demand uh, for bonds. Okay, why is that? Again, because the return on bonds is gonna be higher. Um, and uh, sorry, the people are gonna be willing to hold more assets and including bonds. And so the demand for bonds should increase, okay? There's also going to be a supply side effect here, okay? Because we have economic expansion, you would expect the profitability of firm investments the profitability of firm investment is going to go up right if you're expanding then you want to increase capacity people are buying more goods and services firms are need, going to increase their capacity and have to buy new capital and equipment in order to do so and so because of that increased profitability and the need to raise capacity for firms to meet expansion you would also expect an increase in the supply or issuance of new bonds, okay? So again, like in the last example we looked at, there's a couple different things that are happening here. There's demand side effects and si supply side effects, um, which are, are happening sort of at the same time. And so we have to um, be a little bit careful about how How the curves shift out. So this is our economic expansion example. As I said, here's our effects here. So we have bond supply and our bond demand initially, right? Whoops. What happened here? Oh. And so initially what happens, as I said, there's gonna be uh, a need for firms to wanna issue more credit. Bond supply is gonna go up. And so 
we're starting off here and here again that this on the supply side you'd expect that to increase okay we also know that the demand for bonds is going to go up people want to hold more assets because they can and so you would expect the demand side to shift uh, to the right as well okay now we're only going to assume it shifts ju out just a little bit and I'll explain why that is in just a second and so if the demand curve shifts out just a little bit relative to supply which shifts out more then you would expect the equilibrium effects are going to be such that the total amount of bonds in circulation is going to go up but more importantly what's going to happen is the price is going to fall and what does this mean for the interest rate it's going to go up right price goes down the interest on bonds is going to go up okay now let's get back to this sort of differential shift that I showed here. I did this, and the reason why is because if you look at the actual data on business cycles, you can see that it tends to follow this particular pattern. So in other words, in the example that I showed before, um, the example that I just went through here was an example of when we have economic expansion. Typically during economic expansions, interest rates rise, and you can see that in this graph here. Um, it's a little bit maybe um, not quite clear, but during periods of recession, you can see interest rates are going to go down. Okay, and so that's entirely consistent with this story here. During expansion, supply is going to shift out more than demand. That's going to push down the price and up the yield. And then during recessions, you're going to have the opposite case where supply is going to contract more quickly, demand is going to contract less quickly, and you get declines in the interest rate. Okay, so to sum up, um, we covered a lot of ground with the bond market here, but there's a couple key pieces to it. As we talked about before, we had the supply and the demand pieces. Uh, the demand, as you'd expect, is downward sloping. The supply is upward sloping as it relates to the price and of course keeping in the back of your head that the price and the interest rate are inversely related okay we saw how the bond market reaches equilibrium through the, the normal market processes that you would expect and we also looked at various examples um, but we didn't cover the entire spectrum of it of things that are going to shift the demand shift the supply curve and yield new equilibrium and hence new interest rates um, as a result of these shocks thank you